Gabriel's Gospel Grace, changing lives and kingdom building one stone at a time. Well, hello and good evening to you and welcome to our Tuesday episode of the week. This is a program where we bring together couples who are married Christian couples who live a Christian lifestyle. But for many people, that's a kind of new concept. I know many young people at the moment are looking at marriage from its traditional point of view, but they don't have many role models to look up to. So this program brings in some what I would call successful Christian marriages. So let's get straight to our couple for today. They're not new to the program. In fact, they're one of our favourites. Good evening to you, the Sharps. Greetings from Hello. West Yorkshire. <laughs> and how is everyone in West Yorkshire? I understand that apparently temperatures have been going up down there. It's a bit warmer this morning, so um, it's really great. Well, of course, the other thing is uh, we are literally following on from your brother, um, who was a nice surprise to the show last week. And I'd just like to underline the fact that I am the younger brother. <laughs> um, a lot of people think that we're twins, believe it or not. They say, oh, you're, you're twins. I mistook you. When you walk through the door, I thought you were Andrew and we have all this. And then they say, are you his twin? And I said, no. And then they say, are you his older brother? I said, no, I'm three and a half years younger. So I just want to emphasize that I'm three and a half years younger. Uh, I hope I don't look that old, but... Uh... <laughs> well, I can relate to that. I get the same thing with my brother. But actually, when I was younger... A lot more often, people thought me and my cousin was uh, actually brothers. Yes. So that was a, another little twist. Back then, I used to have really thick, wavy hair. Mm, all right. It's gone now. Uh, <laughs> Saves just, me on. Uh, Go on. And just one thing we need to correct from last year, uh, last time's uh, appearance with you. Now, okay. I said we'd be married 36 years. Right. And actually, we'd be married 37. <laughs> <laughs> I now, got that wrong. <laughs> I was going to say, now you realise that when that question came up with your brother, he turned to the wisdom of his wife to answer that question. <laughs> well, I remembered it wrong. It was 37, not 36. <laughs> well, congratulations. And obviously, from a viewer's perspective, I think we could say they've got a little bit of experience in marriage. <laughs> Amen. Now, interesting, you mentioned uh, your brother, Andrew, because um, I'm also aware of some stories about your childhood, one in particular is uh, that you used to play radio stations. Is that correct? <laughs> oh, good gracious me. That was some time ago. Yes, we we used to play radio stations. I'd be upstairs in the bedroom playing records and um, doing the sort of the DJ bit. And there was a record player and an amplifier and a wire that went out the bedroom window, went in the lounge window downstairs, plugged into a speaker, and everybody in the living room was uh, pretending they were listening to live radio when it was just... Uh, <laughs> Just me upstairs. <laughs> you and your brother. Me and my brother. You and your brother. Well, it's interesting because, uh, well, I'm actually going to come on to that in a second. This is what the theme of today is. But Gail, what about yourself? Have you got siblings? Uh, yes, I have an older brother and an older sister. So I'm the youngest child. I'm the baby of the family. Um, so, yes, and I, I remember often playing with my sister. We grew up together. She's about two years older than me. Um, and we did lots and lots of things together. Um we learnt musical instruments together and went on music courses together. Um, so probably more so than my brother. Um, I used to remember him bullying me a bit, <laughs> but I think a lot of baby sisters have that memory of their big brothers. <laughs> but yes. Um, sorry, so I think some, sometimes baby brothers have that same example as well. Apparently my, my night's so stressed. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> but the theme of today is actually friendships. And the reason I've kind of come on to the whole thing about siblings is because when we're born, I mean, our parents are literally, you know, they are our rock. But then we have these other strange young people around us who might be a bit older, like your brother. But they're the people we learn to play with, grow with and adapt with. In a way, that's the first form of friendship, because as we know, siblings don't always get on. Siblings from birth don't necessarily get on. I know one of our other guests had a lot of challenging scenarios when he was a child. And that was from his siblings. Um, but really, that's the basis of what becomes a template for friendships. And I think when I think back to myself and even my children, the day they leave the home and start school and they're surrounded by more strangers, this is where that skill set of finding what you have in common, playing together, developing these social skills. But really, that's where friendship has to start to form. But when you think about it, the template was possibly back in the family with regards to being with your siblings. 
And I think when it comes to relationships, even more so when it comes to marriage, we're going to, we're going to meet a stranger and that stranger is going to become like family to us. We're going to end up living with them, sharing with them. Uh, literally, our whole life is going to be dependent on them in marriage. But from that point of view, how have you found your relationships with people? Do you kind of find that there is a, a sort of stemming back from your childhood and, and how you make friends? And is it interest based or is it more feelings based with regards to familiarity? I think sort of all our friends seem to be um, interest based, don't they? You know, we have a, that common theme of loving the Lord. So I, I guess our friends mostly will be people with that church interest, God interest, grace interest, Jesus interest, wanting to know with more interests. And, and that's the, the common foundation. I guess there are a few friends that I, I've, uh, that when I was younger, girl, uh, Joshua, which is who is our son, and I, we used to have, go to a railway uh, circle, which was a sort of a group of really old men talking about steam trains and everything. So we had friendships. We had friendships there that they've they've uh, uh, that relate those relationships have now moved on from that. But uh, yes, we've had interest. Uh, they're mostly interest uh, uh, relationships. Gail, yes, um, I I would think the majority of them are interest related and i i do i have many many christian friends and um i find relating to people and making friends when you are christian is much easier because you have that spiritual dimension um and that common understanding of love for god and it opens up a whole new realm inside friendships um, because you feel that connection, which you don't feel when you're trying to make friends with somebody who isn't a believer. So I do have a few unbelieving friends, but I, I never go, they're never on the same depth as, as relationships that you have with, with other Christians, with other believers. Well, it's interesting uh, with Andrew and Jasmine that looking at their foundation, that they spent all this time together as friends, but they were in that comfortable place. Like, you know, when you were brothers with your feet up on the settee, just watching you know bullseye or something like that 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 kind of place of comfort is not easy with strangers or even what you call friends friends from school mm -hmm. but they got to that comfort place without actually being in love with each other so that that kind of family feeling was there and i think this is kind of where i'm coming back towards yourself with having a church because in a way church is that christian family it's brothers and sisters yes. in christ yes. mm -hmm. in fact there are there are folks in our congregation who regard us uh, as their family more than their blood family mm. it used to be quite embarrassing really uh, there was this old woman in, in the church or older woman in the church you remember her she's she's passed away now um eileen they called her and, and she was a she was a quite of a character and uh she was widowed and had no one to look after her so as the pastor i i, I had quite a lot of input in, uh, in her life, talking to the council and sorting out things with the doctor and what have you. And one day she said, uh, she says, um, she says, if I could have my life all over again, I'd like you to be my father. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice. And um, what a compliment. But yes, I think that's the thing there, isn't it? Go on. I, I, I'm, and, a, and a lot of the older ladies in the congregation, should I say now, look at me as their son and daughter and right. even Joshua as their grandson. Right. Um, so that's the kind of family relationship that we have within the congregation. And I think again, because of how language is used these days, I mean, people say, I mean, there's a saying, isn't there? Oh, you don't choose your family. Well, mm. actually you do. The confusion is relatives. <laughs> you don't choose your relatives. I think that's the word that's not used anymore to realize that yeah. typically, traditionally, and even where I live, where there's still lots of farming families, the family and relatives are part of that same unit. They're all going together. They'll all have different unique roles, but for that family and that farm to, to thrive and survive, they have to all be moving in the same direction. Yes, yes. And I think that's probably what I would define as the key to family. It doesn't mean you're not gonna squabble. It doesn't mean you're not gonna fall out. Mm. But at the same time, you're not gonna take full offense that you're gonna run away mm. when it gets tough. Yes. You're going to stand together yeah. as one family unit. 
That's but now right. we come back to marriage because marriage is the seed of a new family unit. And that's where I come back to with you guys, that the whole of the friendship and the family aspect, especially with you marrying people, how, how have you found that in relationships? I mean, is that something you look for when a couple present themselves for marriage? Um, I think that the first question that I ask somebody who wants to get married is, why do you want to get married? And the, and, and the right answer should be, not because we love one another, funny enough, but because God wants us to get married. There we are. There's an interesting response, isn't there? <clears throat> and I think that, that, that Christ has always got to be the center of a marriage because love can be fleeting. Yeah, It can come and go. And we're going back to sort of family relationships. Family, family relationships are unconditional. Um, the prodigal son, even though the son messed up, the father still regarded him as his son. Um, and, you know, uh, unconditional love is, is what we need, not just sort of lovey-dovey love. Um, agape love, I guess, is what I'm coming around to say. And Christ has always got to be the reason why we got married. Yeah, I mean, I did a uh, Motivational Monday just the other week, and it was about the key to happiness. And I, I emphasize the fact that feeling happy is not a state of happiness. Mm. And I think that being in love, and again, I refer back to your, your brother and Jasmine, they fell in love after they realized they loved each other. I think, it, yes. you know, Jasmine said it's only when they went back to kind of getting on with life after college, they realized there's something missing, something so fundamental mm. in their lives. And only at that point did they fall in love. And I think even traditional historic marriages were not based on love. In fact, it was more politics and uh, arrangements. Yeah. I mean, in this day and age, it probably would have been carried out on a golf course. Mm. In, in fact, uh, I once heard somebody argue that you could uh, prove from scripture that all marriages should be arranged, but uh, we won't go down that. <laughs> we won't go down that avenue. But certainly when somebody presents themselves to me as wanting to get married, uh, you, you've got to think to yourself, well, do they get on? Uh, you know, you, you do observe some people in their relationships and those that always seem to, seem to be arguing and, uh, you know, wanting to do their own thing and always making a scene of things and being known as argumentative amongst the rest of the congregation. And they'd say, oh, pastor, we think we want to get married. Um, uh, are you sure? Are you sure you just don't want sex? Uh, because that's, re that's usually what drives somebody, the hormones. Yeah. Um, and so we, we, you have to sort of um, differentiate all these things, whether whether God's in it, um, whether they really do love one another, whether it's an unconditional love or whether it's a superficial love, and, and whether that love is just sort of a, an eros love, a sort of a sexual sort of passion that they, they need to satisfy. Um, yeah. Well, I was, I'm going to say, I, I listened just the other day to uh, Brother Jesse Duplantis, talking yes. about uh, makeup as it happens and he was saying that you know my wife kathy she looks great in makeup she don't look so great without makeup but she still looks great so i always say kathy wherever we go keep wearing your makeup yes. but it's not because of what's on the outside he said this yes. is the problem that most people he said at the end of the day we're all aging we're all changing and we're not going to look that good in the future and even when you take that makeup on and it's all yes. wrinkles it will look bad and he said, it's the problem is that people are too busy looking on the outside for all relationships, even friendships, that they're not really looking at the soul of a person. And more importantly, they're not seeing the spirit. And that's the, that's the eternal bit. That's the bit you should be looking for in friendships and in relationships. Yeah. So go mm. on. And, and the quality of a wife. Now, Gal will, will quote Proverbs to me then. What's the quality of a wife? Um, not, <laughs> not, to, <laughs> not, not to be adorned with jewellery, but... Uh, that's actually one uh, one Peter three uh, seven. Um, sorry, one Peter three. Actually, I've got it here. Uh, one Peter three three. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. I love that scripture. Um, 
And I mean, that's that is actually written to a, a wife submitting to her husband. But I think that I know it talks about the plaiting of hair and the wearing of jewelry, but putting that aside, I think living with the incorruptible beauty of a quiet and gentle spirit is what we should all be doing as Christians, every one of us, um, because that means we're living from the spirit. And the Bible tells us to live from our spirit, to walk in the spirit, um, not yeah. according to the flesh. We're living from Jesus within us. And that's what that is saying to me. And I think that is not only the um, the recipe for a successful marriage, it's the recipe for a successful Christian life, whatever you're doing, wherever you're walking, to walk from the spirit, to walk from let Jesus out, if you like. He's within us by his spirit, and we need to walk releasing him into our lives and into the lives of others as, as we go through our lives. Because often, uh, I hope, Gabriel, I hope you don't mind me just going off a little bit to the side now, but um, often uh, as a pastor, while I have people come to us, come particularly to Gail, the wife will come particularly to Gail, saying that they're worried about their husband who's an unbeliever, uh, what should they do? What should they do? Should they leave him? Uh, well, of course, uh, Scripture tells us you don't leave your husband unless um, unless they're not willing to live with you now that you're a, or you're a believer. And um, and wives will often say, "Well, what meeting can I get them to?" And uh, they're they're quite sort of. Um, uh, uh, conniving in in things of what they could do, sort of, uh, shall I leave tracks in his bedroom cabinet, and uh, <laughs> shall I leave tracks in his sandwich box, and <laughs> and uh, how how can I how can I arrange a, a meeting by accident with somebody at the coffee shop uh, who, who, who's a Christian, and it all comes back to this advice: look, just be kind and gentle, uh, and show Christ within you. And that is going to be the thing that convinces your husband more than leaving tracks in his sandwiches or anything like that. Amen. Well, I mean, on the back of that, I mean, I'll, I'll reveal one of my stories. I remember going on a date with someone and it was probably in my early phase of dating. I don't mean as a child. This was after I've been married and had children and got divorced and, and moved on to the second part of life. And I remember having this, this, we sat and we talked and half an hour in, I thought it was going really well. And then she asked one question, which totally threw me off. She said, so who are you really? And I kind of did a double take. She went, you've told me about what you've done, what you do, places you've been, your achievements, but I want to know who you really are. And there was something in that moment that made me feel naked, vulnerable, and exposed. Because it was like, almost for the very first time, someone saw my spirit. And I still remember the feeling of that. And I think in that moment, there is this sense of, if someone can truly see me, why would they want to get to know me? Mm -hmm. And I think this is still fundamentally part of relationships, but more so when it comes to love relationships in marriage. And it comes back to the Christian life, doesn't it? That there's part of a person that doesn't feel worthy. When they find someone mm. who really is special to them, they you know, they light up their life, they bring inspiration, they, they show them their own potential, again, like Jesus. It's so hard sometimes to open up to that vulnerability, isn't it? Yes, yes, indeed. Indeed. Um, it's true that, that again, um, people will... Um, before God say they are not worthy because God knows everything about me. He, he knows the other things that other people around me don't. And because he knows the things truly about me, he's never going to answer my prayer. And of course it always comes back to the, it's not about who you are and what you've done, but about what Jesus has already done. It's about grace and God doesn't treat you according to your behavior how good or how bad you are whilst we were yet sinners christ died for you so we have all that that conversation but it's yes it is about being vulnerable to to towards one another and knowing that despite your faults and despite your um shortcomings that there's still that unconditional love uh which is offered which is actually you know the picture of marriage should be a picture of christ's love for the church christ loved us unconditionally the husband loves his wife unconditionally his wife 
loves her husband unconditionally, sees us for who we are, warts and all, but yet still loves us. Amen. And Gail, do you think this is a part of, I mean, obviously it sounds like a lot of wives come to you for their ministry issues, and it sounds like a lot of the time it's about changing their husband. How <laughs> how often, <laughs> I think as men we accept, sometimes we do need a bit of a prod in a point in the right direction. But um, how much of that comes up with you? How much of it is about accepting your partner or recognising that perhaps their partner's got a vulnerability, which is why they're being defensive? Yeah. Um I think obviously um, there's there's a big difference between ladies who have um, a, a believing husband and ladies who have an unbelieving husband. Um, okay. And obviously with ladies who have a believing husband, there can still be differences. But when you both believe in Christ, those differences are easier to reconcile because you both understand about this unconditional love that you should be showing to one another. We understand about the unconditional love that Christ has shown to us. And it's all part of our, our Christian journey and learning to walk in the love of Jesus, in the love of God. When you're dealing with um, a lady who has an unbelieving husband, obviously that's a bit harder because he doesn't get the picture. <laughs> no. um, but so often it is, like you say, I need he needs to be changed somehow. And yes, he does need to be changed because he needs Christ in his life. But we don't go in there and manipulate the situation to try and achieve that. We live the love of God out before him. And obviously, there's the great gift of prayer that God has given us, and we pray. And I often say to ladies who um, are praying for their unbelieving husbands, you know, it's not about asking God to change this and change that and how bad he's been, how rotten he's been. It's about finding those things that are really positive in his life and saying, God, thank you for this man. Thank you for his good qualities. Thank you that he's generous. Thank you that he works hard to provide for the family, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and give God thanks for those things and continue to um, live out that love of God before him, as the scripture says, from a quiet and gentle spirit. You have I always encourage the ladies to remember they have Jesus living within them. They have the Holy Spirit li living within them. And um, you, you, a few, well, I don't know, probably 10 years ago, we used to see a lot of these little bracelets, didn't we? WWJD. Don't tend to see them quite so much now. They were all, all crazy at one time. What, what would Jesus do? You've got to listen to the voice of the Spirit. And Jesus will guide you through what to do in each situation in that relationship when you don't know what to do, um, situations that arise with an unbelieving husband, perhaps there's a, um, a difference of opinion within the marriage. But Jesus is right there with you, and he will show you. If you're listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, he will give you peace because the Holy Spirit is our umpire, and peace, you know, he speaks that peace into our lives. Do this, don't do that. And Jesus will guide you through. He will help you to live the Christian life in front of your unbelieving husband. And I also always encourage those ladies to um, never forget that God loves your unbelieving husband even more than you do. Yes. And he wants your unbelieving husband saved even more than you do. Sometimes we forget that. We forget the great heart and love of God for every person. And that includes your unbelieving husband, even if at times it seems like he's been a bit awkward or, you know, confrontational. Actually, God loves him. Jesus died for him. And God is looking for opportunities to bring the truth to his heart. And so as you cooperate with God and live out your Jesus life in front of him, um, mm -hmm. that will bring those opportunities that he needs to see the love and grace of God in his life. Amen. Amen. And I think even when you think back to school, people were never jealous of their enemies. Not really. They were jealous of the friends. If the friend had something they didn't, they wanted it too. And I think that's the point, like you say, whether it's an actual friendship or a marriage, if you keep walking in faith, you keep showing the love of Christ, it's something they're going to want. It's something they're going to see in you and say, yeah, you know what? Why is it Gail just doesn't seem to be phased by the things that phase me in life? Why is it I have such a bad day that every small thing upsets me and, and Gail just kind of walks over it with no effort? And of course, well, it's because you've got you've got another friend. You've got Jesus there. Jesus, but, yes. But yes. when they see this in you, that should be part of their inspiration, isn't it? Mm, yes, and I mean certainly. I mean this is a journey we're all on, and we're all learning how to 
let Jesus live through us. And certainly go back 20 years, I may well still have had those frustrations and and, and difficult days and things would have bothered me that don't bother me now. But yeah. because, um, you know, you grow in in the grace of God and you grow in your love for God and you grow in your understanding of the truth and um, you you then get more wisdom and more understanding and perhaps able to help pass that on to others. But certainly you grow as a Christian and, you know, the more understanding of God's love and God's truth and God's grace you have, the less worldly things do um, trouble you and bother you because you know you, he's with you. You know he's never going to leave you. You know you have that joy and that peace deep within your spirit. And even if your mind might be in confusion, that soulish part of you, um, you, you don't live by your emotions. You live by the truth of what God has already given you in your born again spirit. And you let that flow out instead. <laughs> Amen. Bit. And I think the other thing is you, you said something quite key there. It, when When you're walking with the Lord, when you're actually in church in good fellowship your priorities in life have changed your worldly priorities are shifted so it's not about i must have the nicest shoes or i must have the nicest makeup or the most expensive thing because your priorities start to shift and like you said 20 years ago you you were a different gale but the more you've been walking with the lord the more you're walking with other fellow christians and often i find that i grow from seeing other people struggle and that's not a negative thing it's just that when you see someone go through something you think well i can relate to that and if i can mm. see what they're doing wrong then i can fix it myself and mm. you learn to grow and improve from that but mm. ian do you find i mean obviously gail explained what's quite typical for women that come to her what about from a men's perspective do you get i mean it's interesting that i could already tell there's a bit of a shift here that gail's got more women that are christian some with christian husbands some without do you get the same the other way around? Do you actually have men come into you who, who don't have Christian wives? No, um, that that that's that that's unusual. That the man mm. would be the believer in the household. Not not entirely rare, but it, it, it's rarer than the more predominant that it's the women without the uh, with without the saved husbands. Okay. Well, that's what um, I was thinking. I thought that uniquely, yeah. I was picking up that, that that was more likely the case. But the ones that do come to you, then what what's the biggest issue they seem to struggle with? <laughs> they don't understand their wives. <laughs> now, hey, Jasmine, Jasmine said, <laughs> "Men are from Mars, women are from Venus." She actually said that last yes, week. Yeah. But uh, I think but, you're but right. They, there is that. Yeah. Uh, you you'd you'd have um. It it it, it it's uh. It is the normal thing of bad communication, all right? Not sitting down and talking with one another. Secondly, uh, having a mindset that your wife doesn't need to be told that she that you love her. You know, it's the well, why does my wife need to know that I love her? I told her on Sunday, and now it's the Saturday at the end of the week. <laughs> told her once this week. How many times does she need to know? And so there's that reassurance of love and care that yeah men don't appreciate that their lives uh, wives like I'm, I'm, and often more often than not i have to say well when was the last time you bought your wife some flowers when was the last time you bought your wife something by surprise um uh because sometimes the relationship is simply because the wife is longing to be loved longing to be cherished and uh, sometimes uh, husbands don't cherish their wives as they should and so i think that was probably um uh, the 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 sort of the uh, approach that i might come with a lot of the times sometimes the man says well i'm the head of the household i'm always right my wife should listen to me and, and be obedient to to what I'm saying. Well, th there's a certain element, and that's true, that the, the husband is responsible, but the husband is responsible before God for listening to what God is saying and uh, enacting God's will in, in, in that relationship. And so often when it's the husband saying, it's uh, my wife should listen to me, it's because they want to um, enforce their will, not God's will. Um, so there's a little bit of counselling that sometimes uh, needed needed there, and and you know just a bit of a I don't know compassion and, and understanding I think sometimes is 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 all that's needed and 
sometimes men just sort of think black and white where they just need to put a bit of color in their thinking <laughs> Well, I think the, the other problem is is, is where where are men focused? I mean, for example, when you said when was the last time you bought your wife flowers or any gift, but if you actually said when was the last time you bought your mate a pint, yes, in the pub, and they'd be like, oh, I did that last night. And what about your work colleagues today? Well, I bought them all a chocolate bar. And it's it's this this strange concept of they're not seeing necessarily that the friendship in the relationship. So I think that's another thing as well, because we talked about, we started this with family, you know, your brother is a kind of friend, but he's your brother. And I think sometimes we forget friendship is actually a dynamic of a relationship. Mm. You know, you can have brothers and sisters that you get on with, but you're not friends. Yes. So in a marriage, friendship still has to play a part. And like every friendship, it still takes a little... Because I think that's part of the problem, in fact, what both of you were talking about, is uh, taken for granted. <laughs> mm -hmm. That becomes part of the problem. Well, I they know I love them. I married them. Or, you know, they, or they should know what I, I want and they should know how I think and how I feel. But then things can only be practised if you're actually still being friends with each other. And I think this comes back to the Christian practice, that it's not just saying, oh, I'm a Christian, I go church. There has to be an engagement, a friendship with with both the people within your church and the people outside the church, because, you know, that's how Christ was in life. Mm. I mean, is that is that not the case? Did he did he approach mm. people from a friendly you know, perspective or did he sort of go in like a salesman trying to sell them something? Mm. No. And I think that's the thing, isn't it? Because a salesman, that's always the best bit about a salesman, because within seconds, they're your friend. <laughs> a good salesman's always your friend. They always see yeah. your side of everything. But I think that's the point. Like in our relationship with the Lord, it takes a little bit of effort to make a good friendship work. So believe it or not, we're now out of time, but I'd really like you pair to have the last word on anyone who's watching this who are thinking of getting married and how friendship plays a part within that marriage. And, and what one of the key ingredients are that you think they should focus on? I think the, you know, it, it's it, a relationship is, is, is three courts. It's not only the husband and wife, it's, it's God in there. If God is not in that friendship, it's not going to last. Friends come and go. Um, friends can be for a season. Friends can, um, be with us for a while and then God moves them on. Uh, sometimes friends are toxic and they just need to say goodbye to. But a marriage relationship is a commitment for a lifetime. So at the foundation of that friendship has always got to be God. I think that's where I'd start at least. Gail, anything you want to add? I, I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, I, I, I would find it hard to counsel um, or to encourage um, a non-believing couple um, in their marriage or marriage preparations because I believe that to be successful, any marriage will need. I'm not saying that there aren't non-Christian marriages that haven't lasted, but in my mind, um, you need Jesus in that marriage. You need to know the love of God. You need to know Christ as your Savior and as your Lord. And if you know his unconditional love, it is so much easier to enter into a marriage and show that unconditional love. True, we're still learning how to walk in that unconditional love, and we will be learning how to walk in that all our lives. But we can we can walk with our partners, our, our spouse, showing that unconditional love. And that is a basis that we need for any uh, friction or situations that come up in our marriage because an unbeliever will so quickly revert to my will, my desire, what I want. Um, whereas when we have Christ in our heart, we have that added dimension and it is so much easier to um, to you know, to encourage young people or even older people, you know, as they step out in marriage because they have that that Christian dimension in their lives, the love of God. Hallelujah. Well, thank you for that wisdom. And um, interesting because one of the things I think is we're almost touching on in this subject is sometimes another factor can be a hardened heart. And I believe, Pastor Ian, this is going to be part of the topic for Theology Thursday this week. Indeed, indeed. Make sure you don't miss it on Thursday evening. Amen. So again, thank you very much. And hopefully you'll be joining us again, hopefully before Christmas. 
Amen. Look forward to that. Thank you both. So hopefully you've all gained something from this, and especially for you people out there just contemplating marriage. You see, the thing to bear in mind is Jesus is the foundation of a Christian life. But more so, as exemplified here, Jesus is also the foundation of a very good marriage. And it's more important that you get the priorities right in your life. And the only way you can do that is from that strong foundation and keeping your eye on what God has for you as a relationship. See, when you come together, you become unity, you become one, which means God's got a purpose in your life. That's what you need to discover together. So remember, may God's grace be with you on your journey of life. If you were blessed by this video, why not give it a like? Also, subscribe to this channel and hit the bell icon to be notified of future videos.